This is the third lesson of the Next Generation Security Management Training based on the R8 release. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the unified smart console where things just got better. In this lesson, we're going to do a short console walkthrough in order to identify where we can find which kind of settings. We're going to talk about some graphical user interface enhancements to make the day-to-day -day life more efficient for our security administrators. We're going to talk about old legacy apps. Do they still exist? Do we still need them? If so, why do we still need them? Are there any chance for R80-based security checkups in order to simplify life for security engineers? What about those permission profiles? Are they really taking role-based administration into the next level? And what about admin concurrency that we've been hearing so much about inside R80? How does collaboration between simultaneous admin actually works? And then in the end of this lesson, we're going to do some hands-on labs on what we just covered. Let's continue with a short console walkthrough in order to identify where I can find what. So I'm going to start with a small walkthrough demonstration. Once you log in to Smart Console, you have everything within one place. From the application menu, you can go to Global Properties. You can manage the license and packages. You can install the database. You can see the session details of the session you're working with. Once you have done changes to your session and you're happy with it, you need to publish. The Publish button is available in the top of the Smart Console window. If you want to discard your session, you have the discard button allowing you to remove the changes you've done inside your private session. You have the objects bar that's available from any place within Smart Console. So if you're working with logs and monitoring, you can still access your objects from the objects bar. You're able to open an API window so you can uh, send API calls, for example, at a host with IP address of, for example, and this command is autocomplete, 1.1.1.1. First of all, we need to provide a name, host name Jim, IP address 1.1.1.1, and you can execute API calls to be more efficient with different tasks. Once you've done change, you can press publish to publish that change. You can also, within this window, in the lower left corner, watch for different uh, management activities going on in the background. For example, someone is updating the IPS signatures or someone is installing a uh, policy towards a certain gateway. In the application main navigation window, we can switch to different main applications. For example, security gateways, security policies to view our unified access control policies or threat prevention policies, logs and monitoring section to view the logs, and then we have management and settings for global settings of software security blades and permission profiles with administrators and defining administrators. Inside the gateway sections, we can select between different predefined views. So depending on what kind of data we are interested in for these different checkpoint servers and gateways. Pulse apps within this view provides more details of the gateway itself. What kind of pulse is installed towards the gateway? If the license is all right, what kind of blades are activated? If we have any errors, we will see that in the error application window. And also if we're sending, for example, a script towards a gateway, we will see the output and the result of that script in the tasks application window. We can also, of course, from here, do different actions, like, for example, taking a system backup, doing system restores. We can open a support ticket, generate a license report in order to identify the status of the licenses and the blades that are active. We can also get more device and license information directly from this window, similar to what we were able to do in Smart Update before. So if we would like to, we can also filter to identify specific gateways. So if we're only interested in gateways with version R75.40, we can filter that and get information of those gateways. Or if we're interested in only, for example, specific open server gateways, 
or if we're interested in all machines running Windows operating systems. <clears throat> the license report provides us more detailed information on what kinds of licenses we have installed inside the system today and if we need to refresh our license and when they are being expired. So we can easily save these reports as an XLS or PDF file for further use. If you go to the security policies sections, we can, for more efficiency, open multiple policy packages at the same time inside different tabs to allow us to work with multiple different policy packets. The access control policy, as mentioned before, can be broken down into layers. So we can have inline layers as we have in this corporate policy, and we can also implement it in ordered layers. Layers can be shared between policy packages, so if I do a change in this web control layer that is a shared layer, that change will affect the other policy packages where this layer is being used. So if we go back to the corporate policy, we can see that rule 5.1 that is from the same web control layer as we have in the branch office policy, has been updated since I'm sharing it between different policy packages. We do have a dedicated threat prevention policy where I can assign dedicated threat prevention administrators that are only allowed to work within this policy. Inside the policy, I have policy applications. So if I click on a certain rule, I can get, for example, dedicated log information specifically from that rule. I can see the history of that rule, so I can see the changes that happened during the lifespan of this specific rule. If I would click on install policy here, this would only install the selected policy uh, towards my gateways. And will automatically select the predefined gateways that should be used to install this policy. Like in this example, the corporate policy should only be in installed towards the corporate gateway. While I'm pressing install, I will see the number of changes that has been done since the last install towards this gateway, and from how many different sessions and by how many different administrators. If I click on this link, I can get more detail on which administrator did the change. And if I look at the audit logs, I can see exactly what kind of change has been done inside that session. So I know what I'm doing when I'm installing this policy towards this gateway. If I'm pressing the install button in the top here, it will just ask me which policy I would like to install, and then I need to select the gateways I would like to install this to. Inside this view, I also had the possibility to quickly navigate to specific sections to easily navigate inside the security policy. Also, we have a smart scroll bar highlighting the changes that have been done. So I can click on that to see and identify the changes being done inside the policy. So if I would edit a rule here, this would be highlighted inside my session until I press publish once I then announcing those changes to the database and the current section is not being edited anymore. If I continue to the logs and monitoring main navigation window, this allows me to view the logs of the system. It's free text searches, so I can search for example a specific username like Walter. And that would show me all the logs where the name or host, Walter, is being used. If I would like to search for username specifically for Walter, I need to search within that specific field. So I need to select user and then Walter. And that would filter out the log entries where we only have username Walter. We can from here open other views towards smart event. We can also get access to the audit logs as well as the compliance views.
inside manage and settings I have my global blade settings so I can set the engine parameters for my chest prevention blades for my application control blades I have inspection settings for inspection protections and R80 is having a automatic revision control which means that all the changes I'm doing within the database is saved within revisions allowing me to easily revert back certain changes. I can go to my security policies, I can click on action, I can click on history, and in here I have the possibilities to revert back to previous rule bases. Or if I would like to, I can go to installation history and I can take a revision of an already compiled installed policy and revert that back towards my gateway. Within the main navigation window we are also able to see which server I am connected to. So in this case, I'm connected to the cloud demo environment. In here, when I'm connected to the cloud demo environment, I can, of course, copy the server IP and the host name. I can experience concurrency by selecting to connect with different administrators. Also, I can see who I'm currently logged in as, and if I would like to, I can see the other administrators uh, that are logged in within the session. If I click more details, I will be able to see the different sessions if they have any locks and if they're doing any changes. In the unified console for R80 called Smart Console, the communication client to server uses web services to get the data of the session. So it's basically using a server-side logic, which means that if I'm opening a host object on a graphical user interface client, Smart Console, the client will send a request over web services to the management server requesting the date that is contained within this host object. And the server will present this date to the graphical user interface client. Then if I do a change to this object and press OK, the client will send an update to the server over web services, sending this information into your private session. Please remember that in order to make the changes available for other administrators, you need to press publish to publish the changes inside your private session to the general database. In R80, using Smart Console, we do support the same authentication methods as we did support in previous releases. Once installing the R80 Smart Console towards a Windows machine, all the local settings, crash reports, and log files are stored in the app data folder, local checkpoint smart console R80. So if the R80 smart console for one or another reason is crashing, you can find the crash report generated and compressed into a zip file. So you can use this zip file when opening a service ticket to Technical Assistance Center. In this folder, you will also find the log files logging the communication between the client and the server. We will also find the preferences of the user inside Windows, so for example, which servers the user connected to using Smart Console, localization settings, and high contrast. So, as you see, we are planning to support the possibilities to switch to different localizations within Smart Console. This is not official yet, but it is possible. So if you use the right control key and press F2, you can switch to different localization teams and if you use the right control key and press F3, you can switch to high contrast team. There are some minor fixes that need to be done into these features, therefore they are not official yet, but you can try them. So what's that layer thing? Let's take a layer in review. We have the rule base, so how can we efficiently work with that? Layers provide modularity within the policy. So R8 introduces a new concept called layers. It's allowing separate of the security policies into multiple components, creating a more structured security policy. So it supports multiple administration delegation of duties, which means that we can separate permissions per layer. In the future, we're going to allow installation per layers, which means that I don't need to install the entire policy, I can only install the changes I have done in my layer once the gateway side is supporting this. We can also, for better efficiency, reuse layers inside multiple different policy packets. So layers can be implemented in tow modes, 
So we have layer in ordered mode. It's also called ordered layer. And you will see those references in the admin guides, for example. So the connections inside ordered mode will be accepted if accepted by all ordered layers. Then we have layers in inline mode, also called sub-layers in the admin guides which means that a matched rule can point to a sublayer, continuing the matching process there before moving to the next order layer, which basically means that I actually can combine a policy package with both ordered mode layers and inline mode layers in the same policy package. I can, for example, have a first layer with an inline layer pointing to a sublayer. I'm inspecting traffic in there, and if I'm accepted, I will continue to the next ordered layer inside the policy package. So here's an example where we can see the different ordered layers. We have the network parameter policy and we have the data compliance layer. Inside the parameter network layer, we can see our different inline layers. So for rule one, for example, that's the parent rule pointing towards the shared services app layer. For rule number four, we have a parent rule pointing towards the shared services AD layer. And you can see that we expanded rule number four, so we can see the sub-rules inside that layer. And those sub-rules is numbered 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, 4.4, cetera. So here's a small game showing how rule-based matching is working together with layers when we're using a combination with ordered layers as well as inline layers. So layer A, layer B, and layer C are ordered layers. Layer A is the first layer in the order, layer B is the second layer in the order, layer C is the third layer in the order. The sublayer, layer D, is a layer implemented in inline mode inside this policy. So we can see that we're using Sublayer D has inline layer for rule number three in order layer A, as well as reusing it in rule number two in ordered layer C. So let's start. So our first packet matches rule two, which is a drop entry, which means that it's not going to be inspected any further. Our second packet matches an accept entry in the first ordered layer A, which means that it's going to continue to the next ordered layer B. In this case, it's also accepted by order layer B in rule number three, which means that it's going to continue to the order layer C. And in there, it's accepted by the first rule in order layer C, so the packet will be allowed towards its destination. So each packet needs to match the order of the layer. In our third packet, we're matching rule number three, pointing towards inline layer D. In this case, we're just dropped. So the traffic is not further inspected, and it's just dropped. The fifth packet is also matching inline layer D, or rule number three, and then it's inspected by the inline layer. And inside the inline layer, this packet is being accepted. Since I have a combination of inline layer and ordered layer, the next ordered layer will in this case be layer B. So the packet now needs to be inspected by layer B. So inside layer B, we have a drop entry and the packet will be dropped. And then we have our last packet. It's being accepted by the first rule in layer A. It's being accepted again in the second layer B by the second rule. And then it's being inspected by layer C. And since we're reusing the inline layer D in rule number two in layer C, it's going to be inspected by that inline layer. And in this case, for rule number two, it's being dropped. If it would have been accepted, it would have been accepted and sent towards its final destination. This is just a logical view of how rule-based matching in combination with layers in inline and order mode is working. This is not how it's working in the engine in the background. In the engine on the gateway side, the inspection is much, much more intelligent in order not to lose acceleration. And that is something that's going to be covered in inspection details in a later presentation when we're covering this with R80.10. 
So more information on layers is going to be reviewed when we're talking about policy applications in, in details. <clears throat> Let's continue with some graphical user interface enhancements inside Smart Console for a more day-to-day -day efficiency for our security administrators. So here are a couple of few handy tools that we have included inside Smart Console. So we have object suggestion that will quickly suggest objects into different rules. So if I'm, for example, creating a new host object called Sales Operations PC, and then I want to add this object into my rule, it's going to be popping up as a suggested object. I don't no longer need to search for my newly created object because we know it was newly created, and most probably, therefore, you're going to use it in the rule you're working with. The objects bar is nowadays available from anywhere. So if you're working with logs view and you need to change an IP address of a host object, you can just open up the objects bar from the logs view. You can edit your host object and you can continue troubleshooting your, your logs. You don't need to switch and change views for better efficiency. We also have verification, validation, and best practices built in to the management solution. So we have a validation pane. For example, if someone is trying to create an object with a name that's already used within the database, the validation pane will pop up and show you the validation error, saying that you already have an object that is containing this name. So do you want to continue, yes or no? So we're allowing you to continue. So for your private session, you are allowed to create an object with the same name but you're not allowed to publish that change. You need to decide which object should have the final name and you need to change the name of the other object before being able to press publish in order to avoid conflicts. So we're going to see more of these GUI enhancements for day-to-day -day efficiency in the coming lessons uh, later. So you're going to see that we've been striving to be as efficient as possible when working with the graphical user interface. Okay, do we still have those legacy apps like Smart Dashboard, Smart Events, Smart View, since we're now talking about the unified Smart Console that should contain all the aspects of your security configuration and, and monitoring in one place? Well, we haven't yet been able to unify everything into Smart Console. So, for example, if you need to work with data loss prevention policy, you need to work with anti-spam, you need to work with the legacy mobile access policy, call to service, desktop, or HTTPS inspection. That still needs to be done from Smart Dashboard. Now, Smart Dashboard will still communicate towards the Postgres database over CPM. We are connecting over the old TCP CPMI port, 18.190, but the FWM service is nowadays using web services to communicate to the CPM server process. The CPM server process will then communicate down to Postgres and to Solar. So all the changes done in Smart Des Dashboard are kept within your private session on the Postgres SQL database. And then if you want to announce those changes to all the other administrators, you need to press Publish inside Smart Console. You will still see objects underscore five underscore CR dot C and rule base dot C, but they're not used to store database information. They're only generated for policy installations for backward compatibility. Here you can also see a small net stat output showing you what you actually are seeing when connecting using Smart Console as well as Smart Dashboard towards the same management server. So you can see that we're using the Smart Console new 1909 TCP port as well as the old CPMI 18190 TCP port. Please remember that both these ports need to be open when upgrading to R80 from your clients towards the management server. Everything is still unified. So when I'm working inside Smart Console and I need to work with HPS inspection, I can just click on the links opening up Smart Dashboard and HPS inspection section for my session that I'm working within. In coming releases, we are working on integrating all of these settings into the unified Smart Console. 
So here are a couple of apps that are not integrated. So we have Smart Console. Let's just see. We have data loss prevention. We have anti-spam. We have mobile access. We have HPS inspection. For Smart Event, we do have the Events view. We have the policy settings for Smart Event, and we have scheduled reports still in the old Smart Event view. For Smart View monitoring, if you need to monitor VPN connections or other statistics, it's still available within R80, linked from logs and monitoring section. This is the place inside logs and monitoring section where you will find the links to those different external applications that we need to use. For example, Smart Event GUI, Smart View Monitoring GUI. And the Smart View is the new web-based Smart Event View that we're going to talk about later in the logs and monitoring session. As is mentioned in the slide, the plan is to merge the remaining features into the unified smart console. But why is there no Mac client? Well, we're still constrained to .NET and Windows Presentation Foundation, and this is not supported in Mac OS X. Once we've been able to integrate all the different settings from the legacy components into smart console, it will be much, much easier for us to provide graphical user interface clients for Mac OS X. But please remember that we have uh, our security management API frameworks that allow us to do management changes from anywhere and anyhow at any time on any operating system. You would be able to create your own web-based portal that you can use to work with R80 security management. In the future, we might see web-based applications being delivered from R&D. Is GUI DB Edit dead? Well, no. You can still use GUI DB Edit. It will communicate over CPM using the FWM process and then going over web services. And once you do a change in here, you have to save your changes and those are saved once you're closing the graphical user interface. And then you can publish those inside Smart Console. So if I do a change in here, you're doing changes inside your session in the Postgres database, not in objects5.c because it's not used for that anymore. There's more. We also have customized login banners, so I can have my own, for example, logo, and I can have a lo customized login banner showing a pop-up for my security administrators once they're logging in to Smart Console. We have something called tags, allowing us to tag all the different objects I'm creating and then I can search for those tags. So if I, for example, would like to identify all my hosts that are related to Windows servers, I can tag them with Windows servers, and then I can filter them based on the tag Windows servers for those host objects. We also have context-sensitive help, which means that if I'm, for example, is located in the preference uh, settings within Smart Console, and then I'm clicking on main navigation bar to click on help, I will be directed to that correct location inside the online help reference guide. So is there any chance for R80-based security checkup to basically simplify the lives for engineers? Because inside R80, we have a really new, strong, and powerful report generation tool together with Smart Event. Yeah, baby! Yes, that is correct. There is a integrated security checkup inside the R80 security management server. Now we can basically just run an R80 security management server with Smart Event, collect the logs, and generate a report directly from the management server from any client that is available, even from a web-based interface. So you can do it from your, for example, iPad or Android device if you would like to. So let's talk about the new permission profiles that we have. So it's basically role-based administration taken to the next level within R80. So let me introduce our fictive uh, company called <laughs> Verticon Industries. And Dr. Evil, he is the Verticon Industries super admin and also the di director of, of Verticon Industries. So the super admin has a couple of different minions. So 
So he has a data awareness uh, awareness uh, permission administrator. He has uh, application URL filtering administrators. We have uh, threat prevention administrators, and we have, for example, specific administrators only allowed to work with the, the e-commerce data center. Now, what we've done in here is that we segregated duties based on IT operational needs. So this is data awareness operations. This is the application URL filtering operations for clean internet, while we have threat prevention operations for ensuring that we're not being exposed to any advanced threats. At the same time, we have segregated duties based on organizational needs. So we have, for example, the Little Pan e-commerce layer with Bigglesworth, who is allowed to work with the rules for the e-commerce data center. In terms of permissions, in RIT, they are far more granular. With future graphical user interface enhancements, we can allow for more advanced permission profiles. The permission profiles we're presenting today in the graphical user interface is very, very similar to what we had in previous releases. We've done this because we don't want to expose too much too early to our customers. When we want to make the transi transaction from R77 to R80, for example, smooth and easy, and they should feel familiar with the settings. Basically, what we could do is that we have something inside the database called permission primitives and, and folders. This basically means that I can assign different permissions to different folders inside the database. And then I can drop individual objects, for example, a host object, a network object, a setting on a security gateway, activation soft blade, and so on, on into different permission folders. This technology is, is currently present, but is obfuscated and, and hidden for, for usability. This basically means that we can create extremely granular permission profile settings allowing us to basically control anything an administrator would be allowed to do within the RAT security management. So right now, what we're just waiting for is feedback from our customers, what they would like to be able to do in terms of, of permissions, and then we will add those kinds of features into the permission profiles in future versions. Now, the system contains a couple of predefined profiles. They are in read-only mode, so if you want to change them, you need to clone them to make customized settings of the predefined permission profiles. So here's an example of the super user permission profile. It's predefined, so you can see that the object is viewable in read-only mode. If you want to change it, I need to clone it, and then I can change it. I assign this uh, super user permission profile to Dr. Evil. So he basically allows you to do anything within the security management server. You can add administrators, you can discard their sessions, you can add and remove permissions, you can change whatever you want to do within the management server. Another predefined permission profile is the read and write permission profile. It can almost do anything except, for example, release or discard uh, DLP messages, review DLP data information, discard sessions from security administrators or uh, create new security administrators. So I can, for example, view the current security administrators, but I can't change their settings. So here we have a use case of uh, number two who is assigned the threat prevention permission profile because he's the threat prevention security administrator within the Verticon Industries organization. So we created a permission profile for number two called multi-role. So multi-role permission profile will only be allowed to work with threat prevention settings. The permission settings is set to customize. Under the gateway sections, he doesn't have any permissions at all. If you go to access control, he's not allowed to see the access control policy, and he's not allowed to do any changes in there. He's not allowed to install access control policy. If you go to threat prevention, he's allowed to install the threat prevention policy. He can do IPS updates, and you can see the rules, exception, profile, settings, and so on that relates to threat prevention. He's allowed to change the HPS inspection settings, but he's not allowed to do changes to host objects and, and, and uh, network objects, for example. 
In terms of, of monitoring logging, you can see HTS inspection logs, you can see packet captures, and it's also shown by, by default. In events and reports right now, the settings might be a bit wrong. This is just what we did in the slide, but it's showing that you can see application control and URL filtering reports. We might want to change that to smart event, events, and, and, and reports so you can see the, the threats that the organization is targeted towards. In terms of management, he's allowed to use the management API, but he's not allowed to manage administrator sessions or do high availability operations. So once setting this profile uh, towards number two security administrators, this is what he will see when he's logging in towards the management server. So if he clicks on security policy inside Smart Console, he will not be able to see the access control policy since he doesn't have permissions to do that. But he will be able to see the different settings for the threat prevention protections as well as the policy. So he can do IPS updates, he can change the protection settings, he can do exceptions, and so on. So what about this admin concurrency? Collaboration between simultaneous admins taken to the, to the next level. Simply put, more than one administrator can work on the security policy at one time. So imagine if you have two administrators that might or might not want to collaborate. This is what we'll see when we're logging in as Dr. Evil. So Dr. Evil is logged in to our smart console. In the lower right corner, we can see the administrator who is logged in. And then we can see that there's an additional administrator logged in as well. Clicking the arrow item, I can see the other administrators logged in. So in this case, I can see Frau Frabesina. From Dr. Evil's perspective, one admin, in this case Dr. Evil, can work with, for example, one rule. In this case, he's working with rule 4.1, and we will see this pen icon indicating that he's currently editing the rule 4.1 in the inline layer in the policy. At the same time, we can see the lock icon that someone else is editing another rule within the same layer. In this case, if I'm hovering the mouse above the lock icon, I will see who the other administrator is who is currently editing or deleting this rule. As long as Frau Frabesina hasn't published her changes, this is what Dr. E will see. And this is the view from Frau Frabesina's perspective. So we can see that Frau Frabesina is logged in. We can see that they have another administrator connected. And I can see that the rule that Dr. Evil is working on for that one is locked from Frau Parvisina's perspective, while f rule 4.2 is being edited by her. So you can see the pen icon here. If we're pressing publish as Frau Parvisina, Dr. Evil will uh, uh, instantly see the changes in his session that Frau Parvisina did. If I am a super admin or have permissions to edit and change sessions, I can, from the view sessions section inside manage and settings, discard or publish other administrators' sessions. So in here I can, for example, see that Frau Fabusina is connected and she has one lock and one change since it's changing one rule currently at this time. Remember that in R80, we need to publish the changes to the database. The publish button will basically share and unlock the objects and, and rules that you did changes to, to all the different users simultaneously, and they will be updated instantly in their graphical user interface. The discard option will basically revert all changes that I made in my current private session. In case we have a disconnection or, or logged up, out, the session changes will be kept and saved uh, until we decide to log in and, and continue again. As mentioned earlier, other administrators with the correct permissions can either publish or discard other users' sessions from the Manage and Settings session view. Some more information on, on admin concurrencies. Here's an example where Dr. Evil is editing the host object corporate web server. Currently, the IP address is 192.0.2.5. So 
So this is what we're seeing in, in the database. Now, Dr. Evil is starting editing this object inside his session. So the object will be indicated with a pen icon. He will see the new IP address he's changing to. So it's this case is 198.51.110. On the other user sessions, for example, for our Fabricina session, she will see a lock icon and she will still see the old IP address. If Frau Frabesina in this situation right now is installing the policy towards the gateway and this object is being used inside a rule on that policy, then this is the IP address that's going to be used in Frau Frabesina's policy install since Dr. Ever haven't yet published his changes. Once Dr. Ever presses publish, the information is sent into the management database and available for all other administrators. So now Frau Fabricina will see the new IP address on the object. If she does a policy install, the policy will be installed with the new IP address that Dr. Evil inserted for this host object. Frau Fabricina will be notified that there are other administrators that have done changes to the policy and she can get detailed information on what changes have been done and are going to be installed before she presses OK to do her policy install. So here's some more information on how locking mechanism works when collaborating with multiple administrators at the same time. So basically locking mechanism provides intuitive simultaneously and safe collaboration in order to ensure that other administrators will not be able to override each other's changes when they're working inside the policy. The access control policy can either be locked per, for example, sections. You can divide a policy into different sections using section titles or per layer when you're adding rules. When I'm editing a rule, I'm only locking the rule I am editing. So in this case, Dr. Evil is adding a rule, new rule called 11.2. What will happen in here is that since we're not having any section titles within the, that inline layer, we will lock the entire layer when adding a rule as Dr. Evil. At the same time, Scott Evil in another session is adding a new rule for example, about rule number 10. So this is from Dr. Evil's view. We can see that Scott Evil is at the same time adding a new rule into, inside the internal server's access session. So this will lock the internal server's access session. And if I hold my mouse about the lock icon, I can see that this section is being locked by Scott Evil. And then Frau Frabesina at the same time can add a rule inside the VPN side-to-side -side section. So she's adding a rule in this section, therefore the entire section is locked. So we're locking per section or per layer if we're not using sections when adding rules. So for more efficiency when working with multiple administrators, it's recommended to divide the layers with multiple different sections because then you will only lock that specific section inside that layer when adding a rule. When I'm editing a rule, I will only lock that specific rule. So multiple administrators can work on different rules inside the same section when they're editing. When we're adding a rule, only one administrator can work within that section. So once again, to be more efficient, divide your layer inside your policy with multiple different sections. So you're only locking the section when adding a rule and not the entire layer. The locking mechanism for objects is basically working in a pretty straightforward way. So random task is editing the sales object while Fra Fabricina at the same time is editing the dim set zone. Random task, so this is from random task view. We will see a pen icon on the object he's editing currently in his session. While we see lock icons on the other objects being edited by other administrators. 
If random task is holding his mouse about a lock icon from the finance object, he will be able to see who the other administrator is who is currently editing this object. As soon as Bigglesworth is pressing publish, those changes will be announced to all other administrators and the lock icon will disappear and random task, for example, will be able to see the new information that's been entered in there by Wiggleworth. Let's get started with the first lab. In lab number one, we're going to familiarize ourselves a little bit with Smart Console, the new graphical user interface. We're going to work with concurrent administrators and get a better understanding of segregation duties. So this section is basically divided into three different labs. You have a detailed lab guide available under this URL. So if you go to Google with the following link, so this is a lowercase l. So when writing this URL, you need to write a lowercase l, and that will connect you to a folder where you can download all the different lab guides for this training. So in the first lab, in the lab guide, we're going to familiarize ourselves with the Unified Smart Console. We're going to work with the objects bar. We're going to understand how to work with tags. We're going to work with different sessions. And we're going to test the validation panel. In the second lab, we're going to work with concurrent administrators to understand how database locking actually is working. We're going to understand how rule-based locking is working, as well as object-based locking within concurrency workflows. We're also in the third and last lab going to work with segregation of duties by creating a dedicated data awareness profile. And we're going to delegate the data awareness duties to the administrator Pat O'Brien within the Verticon Industries organization. Good luck.